Okay, welcome everyone to this week's CEDAR seminar. I'm Lisa Goldberg, CEDAR's co-director, and it is my extreme pleasure to introduce today's talk and speaker, which I learned about from uh, our long-term uh, friend and collaborator, Kai Giska at Stanford. Uh, Kai sent me uh, a paper about based on machine learning, uh, obviously uh, right in the set of topics we love uh, looking at uh, here. And uh, presenting today is going to be Emmanuel Plat Platinakis of the University of Bath, a paper with several co-authors listed here. And uh, Emmanuel's topic is when Bayes-Stein meets machine learning, a generalized approach for portfolio optimization. So uh, please listen in. And if you have questions, uh, the speaker has uh, invited interruptions and discussion all the way along. So go for it. And uh, please, Emmanuel, uh, take it from here. Uh, thank you, Lisa. So thank you very much for your kind invitation and to everyone for attending today's um, seminar. So the uh, title is When Base Time Meets Machine Learning. So we'll talk about both portfolio optimization and uh, machine learning. And this paper is co-authored with uh, Jerry Zucalas from uh, Wharton and Boston University and two colleagues, Dimitrios and Hauran from uh, Harvard University uh, of Bath. Okay, so uh, regarding some key points, um, we we'll try to argue that fintech is not funded. So we we'll try um, to provide some transparency on what we are doing. Okay, so we uh, we do incorporate uh, machine learning uh, into portfolio optimization, and this is also part of our uh, empirical analysis that's gonna follow uh, later. On. So this is going to be the structure of today's talk. So first we'll start with motivation. So why it is important uh, to incorporate some machine learning aspects into the baseline portfolio optimization framework. Then we'll carry on with the contribution, methodology, data, empirical results. And in the end, we are going to conclude. Uh, very well known that the vanilla version of Markowitz mean variance portfolio optimization suffers from many uh, issues, and this is what we call estimation risk, the input parameters of the portfolio optimization uh, process. So in fact, um, when we have high historical data and we make the inputs, okay, up to today, um, for the case of Markowitz, the mean returns and the covariance matrix, um, up to today, we estimate them, okay, and in sample, this model performs perfectly well. However, when we do compute the weights, the portfolio weights, and we try to um, use them out of sample, so next period can be next day, next month, et cetera, et cetera, this is going to be a process full of estimation errors. And if we repeat that process for a certain uh, time horizon, then we see that actually most of the time this R ratio is going to be uh, negative. So those are the main issues regarding uh, Markowitz mean variance portfolio optimization, and we call them estimation risk in the input uh, parameters of the portfolio optimization uh, procedure. Okay. So uh, there have been several alternatives uh, to this uh, literature. And um, a very popular model is the baseline model of Felipe Jorion that has been published in JFK back in the 1980s. And this is actually a shrink at portfolio optimization. Okay, however, uh, when we'll dip, um, we'll dig deeper into that model, we'll see that it suffers from many issues because although this is a very intuitive and uh, theoretical uh, technique, uh, most of the input parameters when we want to use, the, to use this model in practice uh, actually depend on high historical estimates that suffer from um, estimation risk. And this is the uh, representation, the mathematical representation of the model. Uh, here we see uh, the mean return, how this is estimated, okay, and here is the shrinkage factor. Mu s, this input, is the vector of sample mean returns, and mu g here is the mean return of the global mean invariance portfolio. Now, why this is the global mean invariance portfolio? Because the effect of estimation risk when we compute the um, variance covariance matrix is much less than when we estimate the mean returns. And we see that when g equals 1, okay, this term disappears, and we have just that term, and vice versa. And uh, the string cut factor lies in the range between 0 and 1, uh, where in the original base time model of Felipe Jorion, we have a closed form solution of the string cut factor that is 
given by this uh, formula in here. Okay, and the uh, variance covariance matrix is the sample estimate where uh, we do have this because we cannot uh, estimate it precisely. So we start from that. Okay, so this is a clear form of string cuts. Okay. And I need to highlight that this model is very widely used. So if we go back on the uh, De Miguel et al. paper in RFS or several uh, recent paper of uh, Michael and uh, you'll see that they use very widely this model mostly for uh, benchmark purposes. So this is a good chance uh, to try to expand this and to see if we can make it actually work. Okay. Uh, right. So again, I'm going back there. We see that this form of string cuts here, first they use mu s, and mu s is the sample miniature, so it means it's a historical uh, estimator. Okay. And again, here, mu s appears again there, okay, as well as the um, the inverse uh, covariance matrix matrix that comes from again from high historical uh, data. And we'll try now, our purpose now is to show uh, why this this original model is not um work. The first is to make an example. Okay, uh, let's take the ten industry portfolio, and uh, we do compute um, the portfolios both with the Markowitz mean variance framework and the base time string cuts mean. Okay, uh, and we compute the mean square forecasting errors. Okay, okay, again the mean return estimators, and we see here the different uh, industry portfolios, and we see that more or less the errors are of the base time string cuts model is very close to the sample mean here, okay? And if we sum them up, we see almost identical numbers. So uh, although it is um, theoretically a better model, okay? In practice, we see that uh, the estimation errors do exist and they do remain in that in that framework. Excuse so this me. is the, yeah. Emmanuel, can you explain uh, how you got these sample means? Did you use a source of data? Did you use a particular period? Yeah, uh, this is with uh, a 20 year expanding period, and we have an out of sample period of about 40 years. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, so uh, this is this is this, these are estimates. I'm not sure what yeah. the out of sample is yet. So, so uh, yeah. what so, dates did you use and what frequency did you use on this data? Yeah, so those are monthly frequency, okay, and we we set up a 20 year expanding window. We, we compute the estimates, okay, through that window, and then we compare this estimate with the next actual realization of that return. Uh huh. And this okay, is the absolute here... value, and we repeat that process, okay? Uh -huh. and we take the average. So does your does your sample period, for example, uh, include like the great financial crisis? Uh yeah, like two thousand and eight. Yeah, yeah, because we have data from 1960, so we have a 20-year expanding window in that case. And given that we uh, move it forward up to the end of our sample in 2021, this includes everything and the, the yeah. COVID period. So, so for example, if you were computing this, if you were doing a, an estimate, say, in 2009 in April, when... Yeah. For the past couple of years, uh, returns had been very negative, probably, in all of those certainly yeah. uh, anything financial, but in, in all of those. And then all of a sudden, uh, the realized returns start to turn positive. You're going to find some huge errors in that period. Is that, yeah. assume that's a, where a, a big source of your error. Is that true? Yeah, is that true? Yes, of course. Okay. Thanks. Just trying to get the empirical picture in my head. Yeah. So uh, to repeat again, we have an expanding window of 20 years, right? And we, we compute the estimates, and these estimates are used for the next period, right? So what we do is that we take the absolute value of the error between what we estimate and the actual realization of the next period, and we move it forward through an expanding window until the end of our sample, and this is the squared error here. And, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. All I want to say is that the errors between uh, the plain Markowitz um, uh, version of portfolio optimization based on are very comparable. We don't see any really any any. Yeah. Yeah, just one more thing. I'm not sure why you're calling that Markowitz. He, he certainly was not an advocate of using historical returns to forecast future returns. Yes, I, but it, it, it's kind of a statistics 101. Even in his 1952 paper, uh, yeah. he talks about how that's not such a hot idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, th th thanks a lot for, for this comment. So let's move forward. Um, this is 
okay, so this is the first drawback that we are gonna improve, all right? So the mean estimators, because if I go back again, we see that that depends on the historical mean, the first component of this string cuts estimator, okay? So this is the first thing that we are gonna improve. The second one is the string cuts factor. So if I go again back, we see that this string factor is the same across different assets, right? Uh, However, this is not convenient and efficient because, you know, uh, if we have uh, a certain number of facets in our portfolio, probably uh, some of them can be can be grouped uh, into certain, certain clusters, right? So maybe some of them are homogeneous uh, with a couple of others. So for this reason, uh, we okay, so this is the out of sample uh, period for the example of 10 industry portfolios. We have several portfolios in our particular results, we see. Um, it it moves okay between um, theoretically it moves between zero and one here it moves between uh, 0.45 and 0 0.7 0 0.75 uh, but the main issue here is that uh, okay this ring cuts factor is, is is the same across assets what we try to do is we'll use some clustering ensembles technique okay so that we can group the existing assets we have into clusters and have a different string cuts factor assigned to different clusters. Okay. The third one uh, is about the inverse covariance matrix, where if I'm going back again, we see that the inverse is here, okay, in the string cuts estimator. And when we have the um uh, we have the formula for the optimization. And um, regarding uh, this, uh, when we compute the condition numbers, condition numbers, what this is, uh, the norm of the inverse times the norm of the matrix, okay? And uh, we can find out through this uh, whether we have ill-conditioned um, numbers, condition numbers or not. And again, uh, by using, by um, doing exactly the same like before with the gear expanding window and we call it forward, we move it forward until the end of our sample, we see that actually the mean and the sharp deviation of these condition numbers when comparing between the sample estimator and the base time estimator of the inverse covariance matrices, okay, because actually in the optimization we want uh, the inverse, we see uh, that these numbers are uh, 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 are huge okay so the, 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 there are there are huge estimation errors uh, within them between the historical the versus we see the so through this example this is the section two um in our paper so try to motivate why we are doing this we see that actually although theoretically uh, the base time appears to be superior and um, very popular model in practice uh, there is very little difference between uh, the plain uh, mean variance portfolio optimization without any predictability on the parameters etc cetera, etc cetera. okay uh right so um i uh, i have highlighted some drawbacks um the seminal paper of the miguel gardlapi and raman upal in, in in rfs um, it, it clearly shows that base time is not working in comparison to one over n. Okay, so one over n is um, a very, a very, very difficult uh, benchmark portfolio to beat. Um, several drawbacks, as we have highlighted, and um, when, what we are trying to do in, in this paper is uh, is to try to incorporate some machine learning techniques into that parameters of this string cuts uh, theoretical portfolio portfolio framework uh, in here. Okay. Right. Yeah, this is uh, what I have mentioned already, and this is uh, a summary of what I have mentioned so far. So here uh, is the sample mean, the base time model, and our generalized uh, base time portfolio optimization framework. Okay. So the sample mean is uh, is computed from the historical asset returns. What what we are gonna do is uh, to develop a time weighted elastic net approach to compute that. Okay. Uh, the ground mean, again, uh, because this is a mean of um, the of, uh, of the uh, of of the global minimum covariance um, uh, uh, minimum variance portfolio. Again, it has the input of the mean estimate, uh, and, and in here uh, we use again the estimator uh, from the time weighted uh, elastic net approach. 
the string of this uh, regarding the string cuts factor, the base time model uh, is assigning the same string cuts factor across all assets. Uh, here we are gonna uh, we are gonna apply um, an ensemble clustering technique, okay, with the combination of different clusters, so that we can uh, assign different different string cuts factors across different uh, asset groups in our portfolio, uh, and. Also, the last one is about the inverse covariance matrix, okay, where we are going to use uh, a graphical adaptive elastic net method, as we'll go, um, we'll see later. Okay, uh, so uh, our uh, contributions are, um, we make several contributions in the literature. So first of all, uh, we decompose the base time portfolio optimization as I have highlighted so far, okay? So that um, it, uh, uh, despite its uh, theoretical superiority, it suffers from many issues uh, when we try to, uh, to use it in practice, okay? And then uh, we, uh, by, by this decomposition, okay, of the mean returns, the string cuts factor, and um, the inverse covariance matrix, uh, we, we do apply some some advanced machine learning techniques and also make some development, okay, so that we can uh, uh, estimate those input parameters in a different and more efficient way, so that we can make this model works in the end. Right. So uh, this is um, our first methodological contribution, okay. So as I have highlighted previously. Um, the uh, original baseline model is using the historical mean example um, when tried to shrink the mean returns uh, as an input parameter and also in the um, shrink cuts factor. Here, uh, we are going to use a time weighted elastic, met elastic net method that is represented by this uh, um, optimization problem in here. Okay, so if we see that uh, more carefully, we see that in, on those errors in here, the quadratic errors, we have a component WT, uh, where actually WTs take the power of delta, okay, where delta is a hyperparameter, where actually we overweight more the most recent errors, okay? So it is T to the power of delta, and this component in here, uh, this is the tuning parameter, okay? And this rho is the trade-off between lasso, the L1 norm, and trades L2 norm, okay, where we set it uh, equal to 0.5 in accordance to many papers. So if you set it 0.25 or 0.75, the results will be unchanged. But given that we use time weight elastic net, we set uh, 0.25. So if uh, this parameter is one, uh, that will be time weighted lasso. If this parameter is zero, then it will be time weighted reads. Um, yeah, so you can also use them uh, if you have, if you if you want to use this this methodology in here for predicting uh, the mean returns. All right. Ah, and if delta here t to the power of delta is zero, okay, then it becomes the conventional elastic net method, where by uh, trying different values of uh, this trade-off parameter, you can either turn it to lasso or to uh, the reads uh, um, um, variable selection models in here. Now, um, one thing is how we are going to estimate those hyperparameters in the tuning parameter. We have uh, actually three steps. Okay, the first step, step is about the uh, training period. So we uh, every time we have an expanding window, okay, we're expanding over time, we cut it to the half, okay, and the first half is about the training, and the second half is about the validation uh, period. Right, so uh, in here, the first thing is to estimate delta, okay, delta is, is over there. So to do that, uh, actually, um, we, uh, uh, we experiment with several uh, parameters of of, of 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 delta of this parameter okay and we use the aic that's a very very popular criterion uh during training sample okay we could use uh, cross validation but we prefer aic uh in here where the formula is there and for its uh value of delta we can estimate the parameter in here okay so we run let's say 100 values of delta and for its value of delta we have tau estimate through the AIC uh, criterion. And then during the validation sample, okay, um, we minimize the weighted square prediction error uh, to 
find delta and once we find the optimal delta okay during the validation sample we have the corresponding optimal tau that we had computed during the training sample and we do this in each estimation window and as we move forward we um, dynamically estimate these values until the end of our sample uh, period and uh, regarding the predictors uh, as uh, i have them here we have the 14 macroeconomic predictors of Welch and Goyal, okay, in 2018 uh, RFS. Uh, of course, one can experiment with more predictors. However, we want to keep this simple because uh, the scope of the paper is not uh, to extract the most um, the most important predictors, is to use a simple uh, setting uh, by using the most popular predictors that are um, in the literature in here so uh, may you have any questions regarding yeah the... emmanuel again can can you give us an example of what some of the predictors are and how uh, what's the size of the parameter d which looks like your capital d which looks like your look back window what, yeah what, so what predictors are, are for like? the dividend yield ratio the price ratio and the inflation kind of stuff so they are very standard macroeconomic variables uh there's so you're, you're... Well to you're predicting the market returns with macroeconomic variables. That's your idea? Yeah, because uh -huh. um, when, when we use time-weighted elastic net, we use we want some predictors. Otherwise, uh, we cannot apply this because uh, this idea is about the variable selection, let's say, process. Uh-huh. Okay. Now just try. And how, how far back you have you have a capital D floating around here? What sort of size is that? Um, capital D. Um, yeah, it's right here in your formula. One. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, 14, one four. 14. And and had 14, where, yeah. what what made you choose that number? And I apologize if I missed uh, something. Those are the standard macroeconomic variables uh, that are in the literature of uh, this. There is a paper that's called uh, it's from uh, Ivo Welts and Amit Goyal in, in RFS, where uh, everyone in the literature is using actually those are as the base, the basic set of macroeconomic predictors. I see. So you and these are four. These are monthly variables. So you're looking back 14 months. With a, and you you got these this idea no, from no, no. Uh, it's not fourteen months it's fourteen variables and our first estimation will... uh, uh sorry I, I take it back fourteen variables uh, right and capital T then that's my question how uh, how far back are you looking is that the expanding window still ah uh, capital T yeah um the, um the first capital T given that we have twenty years is two uh, is uh, two hundred forty the first estimation. Uh -huh. Then okay. it becomes 241, 242, 240 until the end of our sample. Okay. Uh, yeah. Apologize for the confusion. And so you're incorporating 14 macroeconomic variables that are standard yeah. in the literature for this prediction. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So uh, otherwise, you know, this is a variable selection uh, 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 framework. So we need some predictors so that we can shrink them. So this is the idea. Uh, of course, uh, there, there is a, a, a huge literature. OK, so um, with technical indicators and, uh, you know, many things. So also a recent paper of me about commodity inflation risk premium. We construct another factor as part of the contribution of our paper for predicting the market. So if you, if someone collects them all together, uh, so those are paper mostly published in um, the top finance uh, journals or management science, okay? So we have about 30, okay? But we want to keep this, uh, th this setting simple regarding the predictors because, you know, it's highly possible that one can play with data mining, right? So maybe one predictor will do very well in some of the results. That's why we just use the very basic set, not other uh, more sophisticated predictors that do exist in the market. Okay. Yeah, um, sorry, just had a quick question. Um, yeah. Just for the um, setting of the problem, just to understand correctly, we have 14 um, variables and are we trying to allocate a particular weight across those 14 indicators? Yeah, so um, this this time weight elastic net will shrink some of the predictors to zero during time. Right, so we just want to determine the predictive power of each of those 14 variables. Yeah, um, we have not reported them, but we can do that. So you're right. Thank you for this. Okay, okay. That's a good yeah. just yeah. want to clarify. I will write this down. Sorry. 
that we can show it by. Okay, thank you. thanks for this. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so we are with the process uh, regarding training and validation. And this is the first, actually, our first addition to the theoretical baseline uh, model that we want to. Okay. So uh, the second one is going to be a bit more complicated, okay, uh, regarding the, the process, but I will try to explain it in, in simple uh, words um, in here. So uh, if I go back to the model, we see that this string cuts factor is the same across all assets, right? However, um, there is um, certain papers in the literature, okay, where they do argue if we try to cluster them, okay, into certain groups, uh, the assets in our portfolio, we repeat the process then that uh, may benefit um, our out of sample performance. It has been reported here. So we have a frame a framework like this, okay? Right, so uh, when you hear about clusters, uh, you may think about different techniques, okay? And if we start applying each of those techniques in the portfolio of assets, okay, uh, I'm sure that each of each of these will, will produce different results, all right? So uh, what we'll try to do is to develop a framework so that we can combine those base clusters in such a way so that we have an optimal solutions, a solution, okay? So the most popular algorithm in here is the k-means. However, the main disadvantage with the k-means is that it has different uh, parameters when we try to initiate it and run it. Okay, and some other some other uh, clustering techniques, including hierarchical based clustering, spectral based clustering, and uh, fuzzy say uh, means uh, clustering. So. We have a framework where we first deal with the k-means clustering, okay, from the sense that we use different initial parameters, okay. So we have, let's say, a thousand different sets of clusters, okay. And then once we try to combine them, then again we mix them with other techniques and we repeat, we repeat the process, okay. So is like this. It looks a bit complicated, but uh, I will try to explain it um, in, 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 in a slightly uh, simpler uh, simpler way that we do have in here. So imagine that we have k-means clustering one, k-means clustering two, k-means clustering, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand, etc., etc. okay, by trying different initial uh, parameters because those, those, those clustering techniques do suffer from those issues. Now, what we do is that we want to select those of the techniques that they produce high um, intra-clustering power and low inter-clustering uh, power, okay? So in order to do this, called Kalinsky-Harabas score, okay? And what we do is that we apply this score across the different clustering techniques, okay? And in the first stage, we um, we select those of the clusters uh, that are higher than a certain threshold of score that we have set, okay? So this is the first filtering step. The second one is uh, information, okay? Uh, when we compare between two base uh, to label factor vectors, okay? And then by doing this, by for each uh, label factor vector, uh, we have the mean, uh, the average mutual information. And then in the end, we get rid of some clusters that do not pass a threshold. And then uh, we uh, compute uh, a weight so that we can combine them. Uh, and in the end, we repeat this process first with many class K means clustering uh, techniques. So by trying different in, um, initial parameters. And in the end, we have uh, an enhanced combined k-means based clustering. And then uh, we, um, again, uh, after this stage, uh, we use more clustering techniques, including, including hierarchical based clustering, spectral based clustering, and fuzzy c-means 
uh, clustering, and then we repeat again the process until uh, we have, um, in the end, a combined aggregate, if you like, enhanced overall um, base clustering, where in that case, we do compute the string cut factor uh, for each uh, different cluster. Uh, I don't know if this is clear the process or if you want me to repeat anything. You can please let me know. It will be great. No, I think that that's uh, a tough diagram and was very clear. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, uh, the, 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 this is we do this uh, because uh, you know. Um, Certain clustering techniques do suffer from the issue of selecting some parameters inside. So uh, definitely we need like a, an ensemble combination technique so that in the end we can produce something that is more theoretically appealing. So this is the purpose. And uh, the last one, the last methodological contribution is about the inverse covariance matrix. So uh, I have read um, a very interesting paper from um, from uh, Lisa, uh, when uh, actually they have the, the, the they play with with the eigen uh, the eigen values of matrices and try to impose some upper bounds. I'm correct with this. Uh, yeah, yeah. S sorry, uh, you're asking. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So let let let, let me move on. Uh, so uh, here uh, it's about uh, the computation of the inverse uh, covariance matrices, okay? And um, there is a paper about Godot in 2015 uh, where um, they do up, uh, they do play with the eigenvalues and try uh, try to shrink them in an attempt uh, to produce a high out of sample uh, performance. But here, here is what we are doing, okay? And I will try to explain the rationale behind this. Right, so our purpose is to compute the inverse covariance matrix with the more precision, right? Okay, so if you see that more clearly, this is a problem. And if you see those terms, the negative log likelihood, okay? Where theta is the inverse covariance matrix that we want to estimate. S is the sample covariance matrix. Trace is the is the trace of, of, of a matrix. Okay, so yeah. Given that this is a maximization problem, we want to, to maximize this. So actually those, we want um, low values for those that are with minus sign in front of this. And if we see the other terms, uh, here we have, uh, this is a form of adaptive lasso, okay? Where omega is a different weight assigned to the different um, parameters, and this is similar to the rate regression. Okay, it will be um, it will be elastic net if we didn't have this omega and here the weight. But given that we adjust this weight, okay, when it is imposed on uh, as a penalty, if you like, on those estimates in here, that's why we call it adaptive uh, elastic net graphical adaptive elastic net algorithm for a, a more precise estimator of the inverse uh, covariance matrix. So um, if we want to solve it, we have some closed form solution of this omega, okay, that is given by that one. And then these parameters phi one and phi two, they are determined by maximizing uh, this, 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 uh, this uh, optimization problem in here. So, uh, uh, you want me to expand more on Goto and Sue in JFK in 2015, we see that they have just used uh, this negative log likelihood and um, they have ignored other penalties that may be beneficial, um, such as adaptive lasso or um, a form of rates uh, within the estimation of the inverse uh, covariance matrix. Okay. And in the end, this is um a graphical representation of the of our overall uh, framework that i have explained so far so actually what we have done is that we have tried to employ and develop okay so most of the learning techniques that we have are not uh conventional machine learning techniques okay they have some sort of um intuitive and theoretical based development behind so that we can enhance um the applicability and the out-of-sample performance of the baseline uh, portfolio 
framework. Okay, so um, regarding the data and the empirical analysis, uh, four years, so they are they are um, in line with uh, what the Miguel Garlapi and Tripal have used in their uh, influential RFS paper back in 2009, where they have more than, I think, 5,000 citations there. So those are different uh, portfolios from the Kenneth French library, uh, starting from 10, 10 assets up to 100, okay? And this is um, our time, time. so uh, it's from 1963 up to the end of 2021. And we have used both a 20 and 40 year expanding estimation window when we try to measure the performance of our uh, framework. For the uh, empirical results uh, that we do have uh, in here, okay? So um, we do use a quadratic utility function. So the quadratic utility function has lambda, the uh, risk aversion coefficient inside this, and we have used lambda one, three, and five, and we use two metrics, sharp ratios and certain equivalent returns, okay? And those results are without transaction cost, okay, for a 20 and 40 year expanding window. GBS is our generalized base time framework and one over N is our benchmark, okay? Uh, and we see here the various metrics and we see that in, uh, in all the cases we do have outperformance. Again, we use one over N because this is the most, uh, it's the simpler, but at the same time, very difficult benchmark to beat. And we see that we beat this all the time. And in most of the cases also, we have statistical significance, okay? Yeah, so this is the case without transaction cost, right? Either when measuring performance or in the objective function. And in the next one, we put transaction cost in the objective function and when we measure performance because when you have quadratic utility, okay, you have the, you want to maximize the expected return minus lambda over two times the portfolio variance. And in that objective function, you can incorporate the transaction cost as a penalty, right? So minus kappa a coefficient times the absolute value of the difference between the current weight and the previous one. Okay, so that will penalize the transaction cost. So those are the results when we do incorporate transaction cost both in the objective function and when we measure performance. And we see can, that can, they, I, uh, yeah. can I interrupt again, Emmanuel, about transaction costs? So I think you've got some Fama French portfolios here. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's and so those are long, company. short portfolios. And uh, long, sh well, I think they're actually not really very investable. But even if they, if you wanted to try to invest in those portfolios, you would have to short securities. So have you taken account of any of the shorting costs or financing costs that might be associated with those portfolios? Uh, it, no, we just have used them as the RFS paper. Yeah, but you're right that in practice, they, they do have a, a transaction cost side, yeah. They have costs beyond trading. I think you're taking account of some kind of trading cost related to turnover, if I'm listening. Yeah, uh, so the, yeah exactly. So the transaction cost in our case is just the turnover when we do rebalance the portfolio, yeah. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, but you, you, you're right on this. Plus, if you're going to invest on momentum or, uh, you know, value growth portfolios, uh, you need, okay. you need uh, there, there, are, there are trading costs there. So you're right, thank you for this, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, that one. So, uh, yes, again, I repeat, uh, when we say transaction cost, we mean both in the objective function and we measure performance, and uh, as Lisa said, regarding the turnover of the portfolio. Now, the second part of, uh, of our analysis is, uh, okay, we have, let's say, we added three components based on model, right? So the first day is on the mean returns when we predict them. So uh, the baseline is using the historical stuff. Okay, we use the time weighted elastic net method as we have explained. We have the shrinkage factor where, with some clustering, uh, we try to allocate, uh, we try to estimate a different shrinkage factor across uh, different like group of assets within our portfolio. And the third one is the inverse covariance matrix. Now the question is, uh, I mean, okay, you may you may have this framework and outperform, but the the question is, uh, probably the outperformance comes from one or two components, right? Okay, so in that case, uh, we 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 split this. So uh, let's say model one. In model one, we just 
have the time weight elastic net regarding the returns, okay? And in model two, we have the shrinkage factor and the inverse covariance matrix, because we know uh, in practice, uh, most of the estimation errors comes uh, from the computation of the mean returns, right? Uh, okay, so that's why we split this model. So model one is just the base time with only the time weight elastic net. And model two is just the base time with the new shrinkage factor framework and the inverse covariance matrix without time weight elastic net. Okay, and we repeat the analysis. So this is the model one and model two. And we see again that in most of the cases we do have our performance and in many times also after the decomposition so we make the model weaker okay because we just incorporate in model one the first methodological contribution and the model two the second and the third uh, but we see that in both cases um, most of the time we do have a performance that is also statistically significant and we use a standard test of statistical significance from de miguel et al in 2009 in in, in rfs Okay, and if you see the paper that is on SSRN, uh, you will find a very um, comprehensive uh, internet online appendix with many robust checks, including alternative machine learning uh, techniques for predicting um, the mean returns, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and to conclude uh, this, um, this uh, presentation, uh, actually, uh, we make four contribution in this specific academic literature. So the first is to decompose the base time string as portfolio framework and to theoretically show the drawbacks. Okay, so after we have identified the drawbacks, first on the mean return, second in the estimation of the string as factor and third on how they do compute the inverse covariance matrix, we do develop and apply some tailored to our cases machine learning techniques and to try to make it work. And we demonstrate this through uh, a standard but comprehensive empirical analysis that uh, we have in the paper. So this is actually the end. If you have any questions, I will be very happy to, to answer. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you for that uh, tour de force. I, there, um, do you know, have you run uh, this, you have um, what you call out of sample tests, but I wonder if you've run something that I like to call out of model tests, like you cut yourself off from any development whatsoever and start uh, following your results, either with paper portfolio or better with live money. Um, do the, um, ha have you run any tests like that? Uh, not really, but what do you mean by out of model? Because the first time I hear about this. Yeah, well, it's something that we do in industry. So in industry, okay. we use a lot of models. And of course, when we buy the models, they're forecasting something. They give us out of sample tests that look very, very good. Always. Why else would they be selling us something? And why else would we be buying it? So what we like to do is to take their model away from them, away from the modelers, completely away from them. And then we start running our own out of sample tests. And we call that out of model tests because we've really deprived everybody of the ability to monkey with it. And oh. to see if, if the new out of sample tests actually look like the reported out of sample tests. So mm -hmm. um, I've never, um, they, they don't usually. Uh, but I, I, I think it, it's actually often hard to pinpoint the source of this because, of course, when we run out of sample tests, we're trying very hard to make sure we don't corrupt our tests with any look-ahead bias, and it, it's just hard to do that. Okay, yeah, so uh, think, that's um, very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Ha ha happy to to, uh, to talk more of that. It's not something I see much in academics. But I, I do think it's a good practice. You really, you, like, you need a separate team. It's almost like you hand a black box off and then yeah. let a period of time go by where somebody who has no nothing invested in it tests it. And it, it can be eye-opening. Um, so that, especially given there's a lot of complexity here. Um, so that was one of my questions. Uh, another of my questions is that you're, 
using, um, uh, if I understand correctly, kind of testing uh, with relatively small dimensional covariance matrices, like the 10 sectors or something. And yeah. in, in practice, you might have a larger dimensional covariance matrix. And I'm wondering if you've thought a little bit about how to how to handle a larger dimensional covariance matrix. Yeah, uh, actually, our framework theoretically will be even more superior when we have uh, more dimensions on this. Uh, so some of our uh, uh, portfolios are up to 100 assets, but of course, uh -huh. we can test something greater. Yeah. OK. Um, well, those were my questions. Can I, I'd like to open it up to the uh, audience. Uh, there are two questions in the chat, but I'll get to them in a second. So I have um, a, a question um, yeah. with two parts. The first is how many different ma machine learning methods did you use? Did you go straight to ElasticNet or did you try other machine learning methods? Uh, for, for the mean returns, we have developed a time-weighted elastic net because we have a component that is t to the power of delta in the error component, the first component, and then we train and validate it. So it is not the same with uh, the elastic net. It's an expansion of elastic net. No, I, I understand. But you used, um, you only investigated elastic net as a method of... Yeah, elastic net is uh, most, uh, elastic net based is mostly on the returns and the covariance okay because actually we we add this elastic net on the negative log likelihood the optimization for the inverse covariance uh, but for the clustering stuff is different because uh, we do use a multiple filtering process so that in the end we can end up with uh, a more efficient base clustering label uh, factor vector so yeah uh, elastic net is is incorporated in the first and the third part in the second part about the string cuts is something different. I ask because it seems like you optimized over a number of different clustering methods. Yeah. Did I understand that correctly? And there's a risk, and this goes to Lisa's point, um, of model mining, where if you try lots of different methods, uh, you may find one method that works extremely well, but when you do it true out of sample test of the sort that Lisa described, it may underperform what you'd expected. And that may reflect the fact that you optimized over many different uh, um, methods and, and found one that uh, effectively overfit. Yeah. Yeah, you're right with this. Uh, we have tried to provide as much transparency as possible within this paper. Uh, but yeah, this is a direction for improvement. Uh, you're absolutely right with this. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Beho, looks like you've got uh, a yeah. question. Um, yes, uh, I have a practical question, I think. Uh, can you briefly tell us about the computational codes to record to apply your method to your data set? Um, the lasso. The lasso is uh, to run all of them. You want about one week altogether. A week, and one week. Yeah, in is the, the computing cost of high, size? Mm -hmm. including high performance computing in some cases. Okay. Wow. What, what What is the bottleneck? Do you um, think? For example, in the lasso, if you want to have many values of delta, okay, so during the training period, you need to try, let's say, 10, a, a thousand values of delta, and this needs to be done for each asset, for each expanding window, okay? And then after this, you need, in the validation period, to pick the optimal delta. Of course, you have to the tuning parameter previously, but can you imagine this, that for each asset, we have an, a, a, a period, and we expand it, so for each period, you need to have a thousand for each asset and for each period, we have a thousand, let's say 1000 values of delta. Okay. And this is repeated as we expand the window. And this is done for each asset in our portfolio. I see. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So, um, 
yeah, we suffer a lot with this, and not only with that paper, but with other papers as well. I have, and uh, this is uh, a bit painful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, no problem. Hi, Stefan. Please, please uh, ask your question. Hi. Yeah. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, thank uh, you. Just quickly. I have two questions, both relating to formula. I think it's 11. I wrote it down here. It's regarding the elastic net for the uh, inverse covariance estimation. Uh, so the first question is, is it true from what I see there in the formula, you do it element wise. So the regularizations are element wise. So does mm -hmm. this mean that you don't really care about positive definiteness of this matrix? We haven't looked at this, but you're right that this is something that we can look at, yeah. I mean, you don't need the inverse of this inverse, maybe, in your algorithm, so maybe you don't need to care about the positive definiteness, but since um, it is an inverse of a positive definite matrix in theory, and maybe, maybe it could be beneficial to look into how you can force it to be a positive definite matrix. I'm yeah. not sure. I actually wanted to ask if there's some intuition behind this or if you've looked into it. And then the second is also, now you mentioned here, and since it is an elastic net, so there is lasso L1 regularization, um, uh, you mentioned it's, 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 it, you wanna have a sparse inverse. So is there some yeah. uh, sort of motivation for the sparsity of this inverse, especially since these are not very big matrices? Yeah. Um... The issue is that estimation errors are related to the eigenvalues, right? So we want this. Uh, we expand the negative log likelihood uh, method of Goto and Su in JFK by adding some more penalties. So this is mostly the motivation here. But you're right that in larger covariance metrics, maybe uh, we could show a more clear improvement. Yeah. Yeah. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh there was I had the same question about sparsity. Thank you for asking it, Stefan. But but similarly, if you, if you don't have a positive definite matrix, even if you're not needing, uh, if you optimize, you will not have a unique solution. I believe, right? You will have non uniqueness. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a that's a problem. Um, yeah, those things need to be checked. So you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, to, to enhance more what we, uh, how we describe and we are doing this. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So uh, do we have any more questions? I'm not seeing them. There's some chatter uh, in the chat here, which I can say uh, the questions, uh, Do are the code and data uh, available for download um, the paper is currently under review in a journal so definitely once it has been accepted uh, we'll post them because in that particular journal it's a requirement that uh, you may call your coach and data available to the public okay good yeah. choice of journal then i'm a huge fan of that so great great for uh only working with yeah. those journals uh so yeah, please uh, do let us know um Next question, do the authors have any work, uh, sorry, do the authors have any work where they try to selection of macroeconomic variables and how do you deal with revisions? Um, those macroeconomic variables are standard data that they can be constructed through a Welch and Goyal paper where uh, one of the authors have, have those data posted and updated every April needs April. So yeah, of course, uh, I believe they they also update previous data every year. Uh, so we use the current setting that they, they have. Okay. So for everyone who isn't reading the chat, thank you for that, uh, Manuel. Um, there's an uh, article, uh, uh, Raymond suggests an article, Fan Lu, Leo and Lu 2015, a survey on estimation of large covariance matrices. And there's a link uh, to the archive with a pointer towards section 3.1. Uh, and it, so please uh, do take a look at that if you're interested in large covariance yeah. matrices. And I yeah. personally cannot help but uh, mention our uh, James Stein for eigenvectors, large covariance matrix estimation, which is in 
from January PNAS, um, uh, Cyan, uh, Financial uh, Math, and about a dozen other places. So please check that out as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah so that's I'm, I'm through the chat here. Uh, do we have any more questions uh, from this group? And thank you, everyone, for, for the great questions. Going once, twice. Well, uh, thank you, Emmanuel, for a, a really uh, fantastic talk. I enjoyed it, and obviously, uh, you kept the audience we, we, um, uh, it, appealing to a, a lot of a lot of interest of everyone in the audience. And, and I'll be following up with details. So thank you uh, so much. Um, for next week, I'd like to mention. Uh, that our very own Bob Anderson is giving a talk with a super courageous title, General Equilibrium Theory for Climate Change. Uh, climate change, of course, is the existential problem of our lifetime. So please do tune in for that. It'll be in person uh, in Evans Hall and also available online um, and we'll be sending out an announcement. So a uh, great day, evening. Uh, thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you at future uh, and, and Isa, if you can if you can add me in, in this mailing list so i can attend some of the seminars oh i we will make sure and get you right on it thanks you emmanuel and what will be i okay. hope posting your slides and uh the recording as well so we'll be in touch about that great thank you very much thank you thanks so much thanks everyone bye.